It is now time for oral questions, and I, rec I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Long-Term Care. The government is now going to move people from hospitals to nursing homes that they do not want to go to. If they refuse to go, will they be billed for their hospital bed? Government House Leader, Minister of Long-Term Care. Yeah, I, I really think the opposition would benefit from a reading of the bill, uh, Mr. Speaker, because if the uh, Leader of the Opposition actually read the bill, he would see that on the very first page, it says that nobody will be removed from a, uh, from a hospital who is discharged from hospital into a long-term care without their consent. Now, just to reconfirm that in Section 60, Subsection 7, it also again reconfirms that nobody will be removed from a, a hospital acute care setting to a long-term care home without their consent. Supplementary question. Doesn't seem to mention billing. No. There are cases of this government and the Liberals before it attempting to bill seniors for their hospital beds. A 2010 report from the Advocacy Centre for the Elderly, written by lawyer Jane Metis, says seniors have been threatened with a, hospital, with a daily hospital bill for, I quote, the non-OHIP daily rate, which ranges anywhere from $500 to $1,500 or more per day, end quote. Can the minister guarantee right now that if a senior refuses to go to a care home they don't want, they will never be billed for their hospital bed? Minister of Long-Term Care. I, I, I assume that the minister or the member must be talking about a regulation that was put in place in 1979 uh, in this place, Mr. Speaker, that has been on the books since 1979. I can confirm absolutely 100 percent that nowhere in the bill that I have introduced does it suggest that seniors will be a move from a long-term care from a hospital uh, without their consent, or b will be charged. The final supplementary. Speaker, again to the Minister, the government's plan for health care seems to involve Ontarians opening their wallets. The Minister has not ruled out fragile seniors and their families racking up Order. thousands of dollars in a bill for a hospital stay. Order. And the Ford government has a plan for more privatized surgeries and procedures which always, always result in extra charges. Why does this government believe it's okay for health care to come with a bill? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not sure what the member is reading. So at some point in time, when you get the answer to your question on the first question, you might want to modify your second and third question, Mr. Speaker. So I'll, I'll give it to the member opposite. I, I, as, as I said yesterday, I can Order. appreciate that they didn't read the bill when they had the opportunity Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or even this morning. I can appreciate that he wasn't here for the lead-off speeches where we identified what we're actually— Don't, don't make reference to the absence of another member. Sir, I, 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 would, I withdraw that. But he has the opportunity now, Mr. Speaker, to go to the table, get a copy of the bill, where he will see in the bill that no senior is being moved into a long-term care home without their consent, and there is nowhere, nowhere in this in this piece of legislation that suggests a senior will be billed for staying in acute care settings, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. To the Premier, uh, this government's grand plan to fix our health care crisis is to throw open the door to privatize health care. But funneling patients to private health care will only bleed resources out of our public hospitals and will make the health care crisis even worse. And we know that health care privatization always ends up with patients getting the bill. If Ontarians won't need to use their credit cards for health care, please explain why there is currently no provincial oversight to protect patients against inappropriate charges for publicly funded surgeries. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, this uh, gives me an opportunity, of course, to highlight our uh, exciting announcement that we made last week as a government uh, five-point plan to provide the best care possible to patients and residents. And I only uh, want to highlight uh, one comment from Alan Odette the, uh, from the Ontario Medical Association. The OMA supports the initiatives announced today 
by the government. Strengthening collaboration with government doctors and other health care stakeholders is critical to resolving the unprecedented pressures on Ontario's health care system. No one group can do this alone, Speaker. We must do this together. Our five-point plan does that. We are working in, with our partners to make sure that all capacity within our health care system is there when people need it, where they need it. Thank you. Here, here. Supplementary question. Well, speaker, that's from the Auditor General's December 2021 report, so let me quote further from that report. We found that some patients could be given misleading information as part of a sales practice to make a profit, and further, greater financial risk by allowing additional private organizations to provide publicly funded surgeries while also being allowed to charge patients directly for additional uninsured profits pardon me, uninsured services to make a profit. In the case of cataract surgeries, Mr. Speaker, these add-on charges cost patients anywhere from $450 to almost $5,000. So my question, do you believe it is your job to protect Ontarians and not the bottom line of for-profit providers? I ask the members to make their comments through the chair to respond, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, it, it does concern me that the member opposite and the party opposite does not believe that there can be innovative solutions to what are very long-standing problems. We cannot keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Status quo is not an option. That is why our five-point plan includes additional capacity, like expanding surgical units and the access to it, like expanding how we are using in 40 communities across Ontario the community paramedic program. These are the innovations that Ontarians need and deserve. I don't know if you've heard from your constituents waiting for those surgeries, but I have, and I want to make sure that where we have capacity within our health care system, whether it is in hospitals or, in fact, in independent health facilities, we use that to make sure that people get the surgeries when they need it as quickly as we can get them to. Thank you. Again, I'll remind members to please make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, I'd like to let the Minister of Health know that my constituents are tired of being billed extra for what should have been publicly funded surgeries. But the most disturbing finding in the Auditor General's report, and I quote, the inconsistency in the way oversight of various service providers is conducted means that neither the Ministry of Health nor Ontario Health has a full picture of outpatient surgeries across the province. This is remarkable. We know that your government's failure to provide oversight in for-profit long-term care homes resulted in thousands of seniors' deaths. So why then, for heaven's sakes, are you rushing into privatization before you make sure Ontarians can get the care they need in public, universal health care system in Ontario? One more time. I'll ask the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Health to reply. Speaker, you know, Premier Ford, our government has been very clear that health care services provided in the province will continue to be provided and accessed through your OHIP card. We want people to get those services closer to home. We want all health providers to be able to practice at the highest level of their capacity because they want to be able to provide the service quickly to their patients. You know, I, I point to a, a quote from Dr. Rosa Carius, the president of the Ontario Medical Association. Physicians are resilient, compassionate, high-capacity people. We need to spend our health care dollars strategically to fill these existing gaps. We will do that working with our partners. I implore the members opposite to work with us on it. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Health, a Niagara boxing legend is fighting for his life. Doug DeBias is a prolific boxer and coach. Nearly a decade ago, Doug suffered a botched surgery on a hernia. Over the years, it got so bad he lost nearly 100 pounds and was unable to eat or drink. His nutrient levels were so low, doctors feared his heart would give out. 
Surgeons have installed a feeding tube, but it can't play, stay in place for long. If the surgery to correct the initial operation can't be done quickly, Doug will suffer lifelong consequences. But because of Ontario's massive surgical backlog, it will be many months before it can happen, and by then, that may be too late. Will this government invest the $1.3 billion earmarked by the FAO to address the surgical backlog so that Doug and people like him can have timely, life-saving surgeries, yes or no? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite highlights exactly why our government proactively made sure that surgical backlogs that happened as a result of the pandemic are being dealt with quickly. It is why we are in a very good place in terms of diagnostic, um, basically back at pre-pandemic, specifically on the surgical wait lists. As part of our province's surgical recovery strategy, we've invested over $880 million over the last three fiscal years. And Speaker, I might remind the member that that's over the last three years because we understood that there were going to be backlogs and we needed to take these steps proactively to make sure that individuals like Doug got their surgery as quickly as we could. And we have funded Ontario hospitals to expand their surgical unit hours for exactly the, re the uh, reason the member opposite raises. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, because of the massive wait list being ignored by this government, Doug's family had to create a GoFundMe page to pay for the surgery to be done in Buffalo in case it can't be done in time in Ontario. Is it acceptable to this government that people in Ontario have to crowdfund to pay for life-saving sur life surgery in the U.S.? And will the minister stand up today, abandon her plan to bankrupt and privatize our health care system, and instead invest in our public system so that people like Doug don't have to pay with their credit card to save their lives? Minister of Health. Again, Speaker, I will remind and reinforce that in the province of Ontario, we get health care systems paid for through our OHIP taxpayer-funded uh, programs. The, the 400 additional physician residents that are now practicing in northern and rural Ontario are to uh, expand and allow more opportunities for people to be able to access care closer to home as quickly as possible. We are making these investments. We are doing this because we understand. We want people like Doug to make sure that the high quality Amazing uh, health care that we have in the province of Ontario, they are accessing closer to home. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many of my constituents have uh, seen commentary and concerns being raised by a group of former Toronto mayors regarding the strong mayors building housing legislation. According to them, the proposed legislation would eliminate any meaningful role of city councillors and therefore the voice of the local residents who elect them. Residents of Toronto and Ottawa deserve peace of mind and that their elected officials are accountable to, the, accountable to them and will act in their best interest. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing please explain how this legislation will ensure that my constituents still have the power regarding the role of municipal mayors and councils and the democratic principles that shape governments are being upheld? Great question. To respond, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I want to thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, contrary to what uh, the former mayor said, municipal councils and locally elected councillors play an important role in representing their constituents and ensuring delivery of local priorities. Council will not be left out of the process of local decision-making under our Strong Mayors Building Homes Act. Checks and balances are built into the proposal. Council can override uh, the mayor's veto of bylaws related to provincial priorities and budget amendments made by council with a two-thirds majority vote. Speaker, it's important to uh, keep in mind that these changes are uh, put forward to help uh, the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa cut red tape and get shovels in the ground faster. The mayor is obviously still a member of council, still would have one vote on matters brought before council in the very same way that they do presently. The supplementary question. Speaker, the residents of Toronto and Ottawa deserve respect and they deserve to have all of their concerns and questions addressed. 
Some of the additional concerns raised by the previous mayors of Toronto about this legislation includes claims that the mayors will have too much power to hire and fire senior staff, impacting the separation between executive and legislative functions. Additionally, they have said that the system provides too much control for the mayor, provide them a veto on decision that intervene with provincial priorities. Speaker, can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing provide certainty for the people of Toronto and Ottawa by addressing the outstanding questions regarding this legislation. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Victor. Those are uh, fantastic questions. It's important for members of this House to remember that under our proposed changes, mayors are still subject to the legislative accountability and transparency measures. This includes proposed new laws that would prevent the mayor from using the new powers when they would have uh, a conflict. The legislation also express, explicitly prevents uh, the mayor from being able to hire certain positions. The posts would include uh, positions like the police chief, the chief building official, uh, the medical officer of health. There are many, many others that are uh, under legislative prescription. Uh, speaker, we're giving uh, mayors the tools that they need to get things done to get shovels in the ground faster, and we're going to hold them accountable to the decisions that they make. We're counting on Response. them to cut red tape, to get housing built faster, so that families can realize attainable home ownership. Thank you for the, the next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Rick Brown lives in London West and is exhausted from more than five years of caring for his wife, Marion, who has an incurable brain disorder. His only break is during her weekly nine hours of home and community care. Before the pandemic, Marion could stay up to a week at a long-term care home through the Short Stay Respite Program. That program was suspended in March 2020. Speaker, will this government restore the Short Stay Respite Program to give caregivers like Rick the break they so desperately need? Minister of Long-Term Care. The, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I announced that on, uh, on Thursday, and of course the opposition have said that they are not supportive of that. Supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Um, Speaker, Marion is on the wait list for long-term care, but Rick could manage her care at home if only he had the right support. A week of respite every few months would make all the difference for Rick and for Marion. The ministry told us that the short-stay respite program was suspended to free up long-term care beds. Speaker, why is this government more interested in forcing seniors from hospital into long-term care than in providing caregivers like Rick with the respite? That they deserve. For long -term care. Mr. Speaker, I, I honestly don't know where this member is coming from right now because that is exactly what we're talking about in the in the legislation, Mr. Speaker. I announced that with the Minister of Health last Thursday. I talked about it exclusively in my presentation this morning. I've talked about it entirely since we introduced this. It is so important that we bring back respite care to the province of Ontario. We're in a position, we're in a position to do that, Mr. Speaker. Many of us, many of us have heard how important this is during the campaign. We're in a position to do that because over 85% of long-term care residents have their fourth dose of vaccine, Mr. Speaker. So we can do that. Now I implore the member Implore the member, if you believe in what you have just asked, then surely you will be supporting this bill. The next question, order, order. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For months now, long-term care homes across Ontario have been pleading with this government for help. And Bill 124 has done more damage to them than any other piece of legislation I can remember. And now the government's proposing Bill 7. Bill 7 is going to violate patients' basic rights by changing the law to allow them, among other things, to be moved without their consent. That's cruel. Imagine this conversation. Imagine this Order. conversation, Speaker. Mrs. Smith, we're going to have to move your mom, but you can't move her. We won't be able to see her. That's too far. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith. That's the law. I have no choice. Bill 7 is not going to work for patients, their families, 
or the people who care for them. Speaker, will this government withdraw Bill 7? Minister of Long Term Care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, look, it's okay to be wrong, but it is not okay. Yeah, I have to be careful because I, I, I'm truly I'm angry at this because what the opposition is doing is absolutely sad and in many ways it is disgusting because it says, and the member will know this, it says right on the first page of the bill, on the first page Order. in the explanatory note, that it does not authorize the use of restraints in order to carry out the actions or the physical transfer of an ALC patient to a long-term care home without their consent. It goes further in section 60, subsection 7, to suggest that no, not only the ALC patient, but also the consent of the substitute decision-maker in an instance where there's a substitute decision-maker. So I hope the honourable gentleman will do the honourable thing, withdraw what he just said, stop getting people Response. worried about what is happening, Mr. Speaker. This is a way of building health care in the province of Ontario, including in Ottawa, and he should be a part of helping us do that. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, it does say in the bill explicitly that people can be moved without their consent. And the conversation I just described will happen. And just because you're old doesn't mean you don't get the same rights as everyone else. Long-term care homes are experiencing even greater staffing pressures than our hospitals. Unlike our hospitals, they don't have a relief valve. To make things worse, for-profit agencies are poaching their staff. And in some cases, the same staff are coming back to work at two and three times the cost. And long-term care homes, they can't refuse an admission. Otherwise, they get penalized. So, Speaker, instead of creating greater pressure in our long-term care homes, this government should be withdrawing Bill 124, uh, repealing Bill 124 and withdrawing Bill 7. Speaker, will this government commit to do that? Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, the member can't reference the way I have in, 60, in section 60, subsection 7, where in the bill it says that, because it is very clear that not only will we respect a substitute decision maker and a, a patient in ALC, but we will also respect uh, the patient's uh, bill of rights, Mr. Speaker. That is what we said we do. The member will also know, you would think he would know, that as part of the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, which they voted against, Nobody can be put into a long-term care home that does not have sufficient staffing and resources in order to care for the patient that's being transferred in. If he went further, Mr. Speaker, if he went further, he would know that the Act guarantees that, and it actually provides up to $60 million on a go-forward basis to ensure that we have behavioral supports for patients, that we can provide kidney dialysis for patients, because for the first time, long-term care will be part of the solution as we build an Response. integrated health care system in the province of Ontario. And despite what he is saying, we will continue to do that on that side, on this side of the House, despite the failings of 15 years of Liberal government. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Year after year, the previous Liberal government was warned about the economic damage that road and infrastructure gridlock was going to have on our economy. In 2011, the president and CEO of the Toronto Board of Trade warned that, quote, the longer we take, the more gridlock hurts our economy and quality of life. We have reached a tipping point, end quote. In 2013, the C.D. Howe Institute said congestion in and around the DTHA has cost the economy around $11 billion per year. In 2017, the Fraser's Institute declared that, quote, traffic congestion isn't just a nuisance, a public health problem, or an environmental hazard. In addition to being all those things, it's also a significant economic harm, end quote. My constituents, Speaker, know these statements and they live the hard truths of them. They are tired of the inaction by the previous Liberal Question. government. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation tell us why, this, why it's critical that our government advance infrastructure like the Bradford Bypass and bring relief to the people of Ontario? The Minister of Transportation. 
Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie Innisfil for the question. Speaker, for decades, Previous Liberal governments ignored calls to build the Bradford Bypass, but under, the, under this Premier's leadership, we are finally getting it done. In the next 30 years, the population of the Greater Golden Horseshoe will grow to the size of what Ontario's population is today—15 million people. With that in mind, the do-nothing approach of the opposition parties is no longer an option. Speaker, we need to get building. Farmers, families and businesses have been paralyzed by gridlock on our major highways long enough. Building the Bradford Bypass will change that. The new highway is expected to save 35 minutes per trip. That's more than one hour per day or five hours per week that you won't have to spend behind the wheel. Speaker, we can't afford to let gridlock get any worse. The time to act is now, and our government is getting on with the, with the job of finally building the Bradford yeah. Bypass. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. The Bradford Bypass represents an opportunity for economic growth for all Ontarians. The people of Bradford, Barrie, Innisfil, and all of Simcoe County deserve to be respected. They deserve to have their quality of life recognized, and congestion takes hours away from spending time on their, with their families, and that is no longer acceptable. We saw how the previous Liberal government didn't get it done. They delayed, deferred, demurred, and when it came to building transit infrastructure, Speaker, they were just, the residents currently are just desperate because there was no infrastructure. So can our minister explain how we are getting it done, how we're building key major infrastructure projects like the Bradford Bypass and how uh, this prog the progress of this project is currently being done? Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Speaker, our major highways are filling up more and more each day, but this is not a new problem. The Liberals could have addressed gridlock by building the Bradford Bypass, but instead they quietly shelved it. Damn. Speaker, our government is taking a different approach. In the Greater Golden Horseshoe alone, we are addressing gridlock head-on by making historic investments and getting shovels in the ground on highways, roads, subways and GO expansion. Building capacity in Simcoe County and in York Region starts with getting the Bradford Bypass done. Earlier this year, I was proud to announce the Early Works contract to construct a bridge crossing, which will pave the way for shovels in the ground later this year. Speaker, it is our PC government, led by this Premier, that is stepping up to the plate and delivering for Ontarians. Next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. A constituent of mine who wishes to remain anonymous, so we would call her Sarah, reached out to my office to share her, and I quote, health care horror story. Sarah explained that after waiting for three hours at Dravinsky Hospital for a scheduled surgery to remove suspected ovarian cancer, the surgery was cancelled at the last second because there was not a single bed available for her. Post-procedure, Sarah's surgeon had mentioned that numerous other patients experienced the same last-minute cancellations just a week prior, all due to a lack of beds. Premier, our emergency departments are at their breaking points with ongoing surgical delays. What is this government going to do to alleviate the increased ER visits that we are seeing from Ontarians with undiagnosed issues resulting from pandemic delays, surgeries being pushed back, and preventable illnesses progressing. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member highlights exactly why we have been working so aggressively as a government across ministries to make sure that we have capacity within our health care system. You know, I point to the ability for internationally educated healthcare professionals to be able to quickly get their licenses so that we have that expanded capacity. I point to the 400 new physicians that are practicing in rural and northern Ontario. I, I point to the $880 million over the last three fiscal years that was invested to reduce surgical wait times. I understand when scheduled surgeries have to be cancelled because a higher priority patient has come in and needs to be looked after first through triage, it is incredibly frustrating for that patient and that family. That's why we've made these investments and that's why we will continue to work with Spons. all of our health care partners to make sure they have the services and the resources they need. Thank you. Next question. 
Thank you, Speaker, to the Premier. It is clear your government is pushing for private surgical clinics, yet these clinics will suck resources from the public health care that is already short thousands of nurses and thousands of support workers, women with ovarian cancer who need their surg surgery in a hospital will wait longer and live in fear for longer. Premier, is this, in, an, is this an indication around bed availability, this government cruel and shameful strategic move to convince Ontarians that private clinics are the end-all and be-all solution to our health care woes? The Minister of Health. Speaker, thank you. You know, I will continue to focus on the entire system. I will make sure through our caucus colleagues that we have the capacity within the Ontario health system so that when you need regular scheduled or emergency surgery, there is capacity in Ontario and that capacity will be paid for from the patient with their Ontario health card. The, the concept of picking one issue and suggesting that that is the solution, we've heard very clearly from medical experts across Canada and indeed worldwide that we are experiencing shortages, which is why we're working with the colleges of nurses, we're working with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to expedite those individuals who are living in the province of Ontario, have that experience and we're educated in other jurisdictions Spons? to quickly be able to get their certification and licensing. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Le Président. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 170,000 jobs going unfilled across the province. We need to expand our workforce to meet the vital market needs to get workers building our roads, highways, schools, and hospitals. Newcomers are crucial to growing our economy and building a stronger future for us all. As my good friend from Mississauga Malton had said, jobs need people and people need jobs. We know that Ontario is a destination that has always been attractive for people looking for a bright economic future, including my very own family when we immigrated 22 years ago. But we also know that we are facing a global race for talent as people all around the world are searching for a better place to build a life and raise a family. Speaker, can the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development share what our government is doing to make Ontario a more competitive jurisdiction to help bring people to our province and address the ongoing skilled job shortages? Mr. Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank the member uh, for that question. But most importantly, I want to thank the member for her leadership in standing up for the people of Ukraine against Putin's illegal invasion. Thank you for everything you're doing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, the member is right. We are facing the largest labour shortage in a generation here in Ontario. To achieve our ambitious plan to build, we need all hands on deck. That is why, Mr. Speaker, our government is making it easier for newcomers to start working in their trade or profession faster. We're eliminating Canadian work experience requirements and removing duplicative language tests. This makes it easier for engineers, auto mechanics, plumbers, and others to move to Ontario, fill in-demand jobs, and earn more for their families. Mr. Speaker, by working for workers, our government is making Ontario the destination of choice for more skilled workers. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Speaker, Ontario deserves to be a part of a fair system, to have a bigger say in how we address the jobs and skills gap in our province. It is not right that Ontario only has a say in less than 5% of immigra immigration applications, while other provinces have nearly 50% oversight in application approvals. It is vital that we address this now and fix the growing backlog. Skilled individuals are in demand all over the world. Right now, when Canada is short countless people for jobs in the skilled trades, the Federal Skilled Trades Program has a processing time of 47 months, Speaker, which is nearly four years. Can you imagine? Speaker, can the minister please explain more about the advocacy from Ontario and the other provinces regarding fixing the immigration approval system and ensuring that we can bring more skilled workers to meet our growing needs? 
Minister of Labour. Well, thank you again uh, to the member for this uh, very, very important question. And she is correct that our current agreement with the federal government uh, certainly isn't meeting Ontario's needs. Mr. Speaker, we continue to call on Ottawa to speed up timelines and let Ontario choose those with the skills that all of our communities need. Tackling Ontario's labour shortage is essential to keeping costs down for families uh, and keeping businesses open and expanding in our province. Action in this file is long overdue, and it's never been more important than now. We need these workers to fill in-demand jobs and build stronger communities for all of us. Mr. Speaker, if the federal government answers our calls, this will further unleash Ontario's potential so we can start building together. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Uni University Health Network, in my riding, has seen an increase in the use of temporary nurses. Their spending has gone up from $1.1 million to $1.7 million over the past three years. Other hospitals are seeing similar increases. Nurses are burning out. They're leaving the profession in droves. Why is it okay for the Ford government to pay private companies more than nurses that are essential to delivering health care for our communities? When will this government repeal peel Bill 124? President of the Treasury Board to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government has an unprecedented and historic record of investing in health human resources across this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, um, since March of 2020, we have added over 10,500 health care workers across this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, the members opposite have opposed measures that we have put in place to support and increase health human resources across this province. For example, and in fact, just in April of last year, when we put forward a plan to help speed up uh, the process to train and uh, include foreign trained professionals uh, into the province, the members opposite voted against that, Mr. Speaker. Wow. When in the fall economic statement, when we made investments of over $300 million to train and support too. nurses, uh, upskilled nurses, the members opposite voted Fonts? against that. Shame. We will continue to support health care workers across this province, and we will continue to make historic investments to support health care in Ontario. Much, Speaker. Recognizing that some investments have been made, but clearly there hasn't been enough, and the nurses that you speak about can't be found anywhere. Anything short of repealing Bill 124 will not fix the nursing crisis, and this is really the question and the heart at, at, of what we're discussing. We have nurses all over Ontario that are crying out for help, and what they're saying, and I'll just, I'll just say, uh, share with one story. One nurse tells me that their profession is seen as a dead-end job in Ontario because what, they are now, what they're now seeing is that health care in Ontario is going absolutely nowhere. I wish that that was not the case, and certainly not within my lifetime. Bill 124 is actually driving this low-wage economy for nursing. What is the government going to do? You called them heroes during the pandemic. Are they not heroes anymore to you? Colleges and universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. We recognize how vital nurses are to the health care system, and that's why this government has made changes to nursing education in Ontario by allowing colleges to offer standalone nursing programs. There's 14 colleges in Ontario that this fall will now be able to start offering this program. Colleges like Loyalist College in mm -hmm. Belleville, Georgian College in my area. Do you know what that means to these communities? We will now have students will have the option to train and practice in those communities where they may be underserved with nurses. We've made incredible investments in nursing education. The standalone was only um, one uh, of those. The Learn and Stay program for nurses in underserved and rural communities. This is an opportunity for nurses You're to here. have their tuition and all educational uh, expenses covered in exchange for two years in an underserved community. We are doing many measures to increase the number of nurses Response. in Ontario and give students the opportunity to enter this fabulous uh, profession. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Uh, Minister, just a few weeks ago, Jamaican migrant farm workers in Niagara region wrote to the Minister of Labour in Jamaica, raising concerns of their working conditions here in Ontario. Sadly, days later, 
on August the 14th, Garvin Yap of St. James, Jamaica, was killed in an accident with a tobacco harvester in Norfolk. Every worker deserves a safe working environment and the basic expectation that when they come to work, that they will return home to their family safely, just as they came, wherever that may be. Migrant workers come to this province in good faith and expect a safe working environment as they fulfill the jobs in our agricultural sector that are vital, part Question. not only to the agricultural sector, but to our economy overall. Minister, what are you doing to keep these migrant workers safe? Please make your comments to the chair. Minister of Labour. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, and I thank the member for this uh, very important question. Uh, first, I want to begin by expressing uh, my condolences to the family uh, uh, impacted by uh, the loss of life. Um, I can tell you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, like the member opposite said, every single worker deserves to come home safe after a hard day's work. Uh, we know the importance of uh, agriculture workers uh, in this province. They truly are heroes, putting food on uh, all of our tables, supporting families uh, right across uh, this province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I did reach out to uh, Minister Fraser, the federal minister. As the member opposite knows, uh, the Temporary Foreign Workers Program is a responsibility of the uh, federal government. They're also uh, in charge of uh, bunkhouses. Uh, specifically on the incident that she is referring to, uh, we are investigating uh, as we speak. Uh, I'm committing to getting answers for uh, these families as uh, quickly as possible. Response. In the supplemental, uh, I'll talk about more actions that we're doing to keep all workers safe in Ontario. The supplementary question. Back to the minister. The agricultural industry is the cornerstone of Ontario's economy, and the farmers within that system are unmatched anywhere in the world. We're known. The safety of migrant workers depends on a collective partnership between all governments employers and workers. So this responsibility cannot be passed on. The responsibility for inspection and for ensuring their safety remains with this government. And so, Minister, you've just tabled the budget. If you could tell this House what you're doing to keep these migrant workers safe, we're preparing for another COVID season. We know that we did not have a very good start with these workers when COVID began. They are looking for more from us. Question. And they're appealing for that support. So if you can describe what you're doing currently with your responsibility to keep them safe. Minister Blair. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said, every single worker in this province deserves to come home safely after a hard day's work. Uh, I, I also want to be crystal clear, Mr. Speaker, that Ontario labour laws apply to every single worker uh, in this province, regardless of their passport status. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have now hired uh, more than 100 additional health and safety inspectors uh, to bring the total number uh, to the largest inspectorate in Ontario's history. We've doubled the health and safety uh, action phone lines uh, to ensure that any worker, uh, including migrant workers, if they're concerned for his or her uh, safety uh, in a workplace or on the job site, uh, can call the Ministry of Labour and have an inspector go out and ensure that uh, workplace conditions uh, are safe. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in our Working for Workers legislation, uh, we have introduced a licensing system to crack down on temporary help agencies who are breaking the law. We have, in, we have introduced the largest uh, fines for uh, companies who aren't uh, abiding by uh, the health and safety laws uh, in this province. But, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue working for workers uh, every single day, protecting the health and safety of all workers in this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. As this is the first time I rise in this chamber, I want to thank the hardworking people of Thornhill for bringing me here. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as the cost of living rises, the effects can be felt by young families in my riding. My constituents are seeking support from our government to ensure they are getting fair rates and much-needed financial support when it comes to childcare, but they are worried. 
They are worried that the daycare operation will miss out on the opt-in deadline of the $10 a day program, which will result in them missing out on a program that will provide them with the financial relief during these times of global economic uncertainty and high inflation. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Education please inform the House on how our government is supporting families in my riding and make sure that they aren't left behind on this deal? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Thornhill for her exceptional leadership standing up for all families in this legislature. And, Speaker, I celebrate with her what this child care deal means for working people in this province. We average this year $4,000 in savings as we hit 25% on average in a reduction and 50% still on track to achieve that by December 31st of this year. Roughly $12,000 in the bank because our Premier had the fortitude to stand up for nonprofit and for-profit child care operators and the children and the families who depend on them. The member from Thornhill is right. Operators were looking for more certainty from the various municipal service providers in the province. And so we have done that, following the best advice of for-profit and non-profit childcare to deliver on the priority of this government, which is money in the bank, savings for working people. And that's why, Speaker, we extended the deadline to November 1. It's why we've streamlined the guidelines for operators. It's why we've reduced Once. the red tape, all to build confidence as we continue our effort to reduce fees and make life more affordable for the parents of this province. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that excellent response. Speaker, I've heard that some child care operators advocated for greater streamlining of the funding rules laid out in the document they received from the Ministry in April of this year. Different interpretations in different regions impacted operators, some of whom are waiting to decide to opt into this program and this could result in families in my riding having to pay additional costs for childcare when they wouldn't have to. Speaker, we know that operators ultimately must enroll in order for parents to save. Many parents in my riding are overwhelmed by the extra work hours they need to put in to now earn more money to help provide for their families. After costs rose by over 400 per cent under the Liberals, Speaker, all levels of government must do better. Speaker, can the minister outline how the government plans to streamline the application process so that we can encourage more participation? Yeah, minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I again want to thank the member from Thornhill for this important and timely question. Speaker, the first thing we did, part of our response to child care operators to incentivize participation and thus reduce fees for parents, was reduce the amount of days operators can take to get the savings to parents. It was 60 days, it now will be 20. Part of our mission to reduce costs and move quickly uh, to make life a bit more affordable. Speaker, what we didn't do, though, is leave $2.9 billion on the table. We didn't leave an extra year of funding certainty on the table. We didn't leave for-profit parents and their kids behind, as the Liberals and New Democrats would have recommended taking the first deal. We stood up for a better deal that creates opportunities for all families. And part of this mission is to reduce fees, significant reduction of $12,000 next year, down to $10 a day by year 2025. Mr. Speaker, in the words of the private operators group, POG is grateful for the Spons. Ontario government for listening to us all the way through and making the appropriate changes. <clears throat> Hard work pays off, end quote, Mr. Speaker. We're gonna continue our efforts to reduce fees, increase access, make life affordable for Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, you may remember the case of Mr. Vibert Britton, who I spoke about in December. At the time, Vibert was suffering from large bed sores, and his sister Pamela fought to have him taken to the hospital for life-saving treatment. Now, several months later, matters have gone from bad to worse, and he has been in and out of the hospital. His sister tells me she believes this is a result of his long -term, private long-term care home not following hospital orders. Sadly, the situation is all too common. Seniors are spending their hard-earned savings on inadequate care in private LTC homes, which lands them in and out of hospitals. This burdens our emergency rooms and is adding to the health care crisis. This has to stop. When will this government ensure adequate standards of staffing and care in private long-term care homes? Vibert and so many others don't have the time to wait. Right. Minister of Long-Term Care. Yeah, yeah. 
The, the member, uh, of course, will, re will remember that in the last parliament uh, that we passed the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, which uh, extended the highest standards, uh, frankly, in, uh, in North America, not just on the for-profit, but on municipal and not-for-profit, because it really shouldn't matter where you are. The standards should be the same. Now, as part of that, Speaker, and remember, they voted against it, but as part of that, we increased staffing to a record, like a North American leading four hours of care, billions of dollars of support. Uh, to get to that four hours of care. We have doubled uh, uh, inspections, uh, Mr. Speaker. This is all part of the Fixing Long-Term Care Act. Of course, the members voted against it. We have also brought in 58,000 new and upgraded beds to add to the system, Speaker, in the members' own riding and ridings across the province of Ontario. So we're well on our way to having the best long-term care system in North America, and I'm very Lots. proud of the fact that we can play a part in building an integrated health care system in Ontario. The supplementary question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the part-time long-term care minister said 100 percent of the residents have access to AC, but of course, that doesn't mean their bedrooms when they are quarantined or asleep. In fact, he was proud that one in 10 long-term residents don't have AC in their bedrooms through this summer heat where they have to stay for 24 hours a day when there's a COVID outbreak. He also said COVID sent seven consent is required to move patients from hospitals to long-term care homes that they don't want to. And he's asked me to read the bill, so I thought I would. The new provisions authorize certain actions to be carried out without the consent of their patients. The actions includes having placement coordinators determine the patient's eligibility for long-term care homes, select a home, and authorize the admission to the home. It also says, uh, because I've read language before, it also says Question. section 60.1, number four of his own bill says action can be performed without consent if supposed reasonable efforts have been made. So given he made two inaccurate statements twice in one morning, will the minister explain why he thinks misleading residents is a better strategy? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. First, first of all, um, I think I better point out that all of us have multiple responsibilities and probably doesn't help decorum to refer to another member's efforts as being part-time. Secondly, Secondly, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw his unparliamentary comment at the conclusion of this question. Mr. Speaker, thank you. We can resume the clock now. The Minister of Long-Term Care can reply. Okay. Speaker, the member uh, hasn't obviously read the bill. He should maybe sit down with somebody who can explain the bill to him, Mr. Speaker. But this member is no stranger to getting things wrong, Mr. Speaker. In fact, last week he asked a question of the Premier with respect to a citizen in his riding and ambulance care. Yes. Now, of course, the, the headline in the, in the papers, MPP Wayne gets recent attack on Niagara EMS unfounded according to the region. Now, what's wrong with it? Well, it appears that the, and I quote from the article, appears that the member for Niagara Falls had some of his facts mixed up. First, paramedic services are the responsibility of the region. Second, the Fort Erie resident didn't call 911. Third, and most importantly, according to the uh, incident report, when paramedics were dispatched, service was done, the person was assessed, all within 35 minutes and did not need Order. to go to the hospital Response. to have that care. Mr. Speaker, the article goes on to say, how did Gates get it all wrong? Well, they shouldn't be surprised because it's a daily... I realize the government house leader and minister of long-term care was reading from an article, but it would still be better if we could try to refer to each other by our riding name or our ministerial title as applicable on both sides of the house. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Stormont Dundas South Kingdom. It's actually the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, uh, Mr. President. <laughs> Under the last government, we saw how ridings from rural and francophone areas have been ignored, though money was given to them. The last member from my riding tried to 
perpetrate the same tradition, right? People are still facing the same problems while we are getting out of a pandemic. Many small businesses have been impacted by the pandemic. I want all rural and francophone writings to be known. I want all the voices to be heard here in the House. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Francophone Affairs can explain how our government is recognizing francophony as an economic asset. Mr. Speaker, our government thinks that francophony is a very important economic aspect of our province. It gives opportunity to workers and it helps to build Ontario. This is why we have put in place the strategy for economic development of Ontario, which is based on, on three pillars. The uh, economic innovation promotion of Ontario francophony as an economic aspects. We have created several initiatives for, in order to help our entrepreneurs and our francophone businesses. Thanks to this global strategy, we have 38 programs which allow us to help better Ontario businesses. Mr. Speaker, in order to uh, in order to have more worker in our province, we need to be able to help them. And one of the challenges that I've found in many, for many businesses in my riding is that very often companies could not get the contracts just because they did not have enough workers to do the work they, didn't to, they needed to do. So I know that for the last four years things have changed and, and I could work with the member uh, and with the minister. So Mr. Speaker, can the minister say which measures have been applied by the government in order to help our workers and in order to help the businesses of my riding, in order to help them attain their potential? La ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the member for uh, Prescott Russell for his question. As a minister for Francophone Affairs, I work very much together with my colleagues. We work on recruitment and training for bilingual personnel, and we try to offer French language services in order to maximize the help we can provide to these businesses. We actually also support initiatives in order to help Francophone businesses in Ontario, and we try to help them to take advantage of all opportunities of other uh, opportunities that come for them. We have tried to make very targeted investments. We have invested many millions for three years in order to support francophone businesses in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question is for the Premier. Sarah is a mother of a nine year old boy who has been on a wait list for autism services since July 24, 2017. She tells me about the lack of trust that families have for this government. Out of 8,000 children that have been promised to be enrolled, few are signing on. Many would rather wait to be forced into the program in the spring of 2023 than to accept the invitation and risk changes to the current services that their children are currently in. This leaves families like Sarah on a stalled wait list. Yeah. Speaker, when will this minister and the government be forthcoming and transparent with parents, clear the backlog, and ensure that children receive the services and supports that they need when they need them? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Indeed, that is exactly what we're doing. We've been working continuously, continuously to make sure that children and youth receive the supports that they need. This has not stopped. We've doubled uh, the funding for this. We've got approximately 40,000 children receiving services. We have five times as many children enrolled in this program in a comprehensive, needs-based uh, program that serves the needs of, of uh, the, the many, many, many people. We're continuing to work on that. 
uh, we have approximately 6,239 invitations issued. We're creating the capacity for providers through the workforce capacity grants to make sure that the providers are there. Uh, this has not stopped, and I would encourage parents and families to register their child. Uh, when the invitation comes, we will continue to push out invitations to make sure that the wait list is reduced and that children can get the services that they need. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, out of the 6,000 letters that were sent out, 30 children have been enrolled. That should be a red flag to the minister that something is going wrong. Out of the doubling the way the uh, the funding that they talk about, they only spent half of that in the in the last year. So families were still waiting. The only thing that this government has doubled is the wait list. The government has touted their gold standard program, but it has failed before it is even launched. Families are enduring high levels of stress, years of neglect, abuse of power, and withholding of promised funding. Parents are tired and they need their government's help. Can the minister explain to families like Sarah, who are sitting on stalled wait lists for more than five years, when they can expect to move on the list to receive the letter for Question. the access to OAP program? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I, I appreciate the opportunity to correct the record. Uh, we have created a program created by the community for the community to make sure that children who were not receiving the services under the previous government, supported by you, uh, they get, get, get the services that they need for childhood Order. budget funding. 8,685 uh, families have received the, the support. Families who accessed foundational family services, 24,305. Caregiver mediated early years programs as of June 30, 2022, 1,590. I mean, I could go on, but the, the reality is that we have created a world leading program. Never been done for before Hamilton Mountain come from to the order. ground up where there was no capacity because the previous government did not make the proper investments. We are doing it. Response. We're the government looking after these children, and we'll continue to do it. Stop. The member for Hamilton Mountain must come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain is warned. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. Start the clock. Member for Don Valley North. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Associate the Minister of Housing. Speaker, housing affordability in Ontario has eroded at a significant rate, making it challenging for first-time buyers to become homeowners. In fast-growing high-density area in Toronto, housing affordability continues to be a, an elevated level of crisis. Almost half of all householders rent their home, limiting their spending on other life necessities. A report from the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force demonstrates that average house price in Ontario has climbed 180 percent, while average income has grown roughly only 38 percent. Speaker. Can the Associate Minister of Housing tell us how our government will address the housing affordability crisis and ensure that we have young families fulfill their dream of home ownership? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my unbelievable hard worker from Don Valley North for the great question, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And I Mr. Speaker, simply put, Ontario is in a housing crisis that requires strong leadership, Mr. Speaker, and bold solutions, Speaker. And as I said yesterday, here in this House, we have an ambitious plan, Mr. Speaker, to build 1.5 million new homes in the next 10 years, Speaker. And our plan, Mr. Speaker, is working. 
Just last year, we had over 100,000 housing starts in our province, Mr. Speaker. That's the highest in over 30 years, Mr. Speaker. 13,000 of which were rental units, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians have seen the home ownership, the dream of home ownership, start to slip under the leadership of and governance of the previous Liberal government, always backed by the NDP, Mr. Speaker. That is going to change under the leadership of this Premier and this government, Mr. Speaker. Our question period for this morning. We now have